Hi, I'm Dr. James Tour, and I have this podcast, the Science and Faith Podcast, and I put up a lot of teachings, both that are faith-based and about Jesus Christ, and, and then also about uh, scientific topics. Today, I'm gonna to be answering your questions, and I, I hope to be able to do this fairly routinely where you would be able to e email in questions, and you'll see that, that email right there on the screen, and you'll also see uh, the email in the description box below. And you could send in your questions and I'll, I'll try to answer some of those uh, during these question and answer times. Aren't amino acids present on meteorites and potentially usable for the origin of life? They're absolutely present in meteorites. You find them occasionally. Most of what comes in on meteorites burns up. Amino acids can come in on meteorites and you can find them. They're usually very small amounts they're usually in vast mixtures of other things, and they're not just alpha amino acids. So all amino acids that our bodies use are alpha amino acids, where the amine group is alpha to the carbonyl group, uh, uh, just one, one carbon away. But you also find beta amino acids, gamma amino acids. You find many compounds, so they're unusable in, in anything that has to do with prebiotic chemistry. Before biology, you could not deal with mixtures because you would incorporate all of these. And they're generally racemic. Uh, if you have more than one of the molecules, they're generally racemic, meaning that you, you have both handedness. And if they do show uh, some enantiomeric excess, it's usually a small amount. And uh, 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 so, so, so you don't generally find it high. I mean, some of the highest enantiomeric excesses that I've read about are maybe 60%, and these were not even for amino acids, but, but uh, um, uh, the, the, none, none of the amino acids that, that uh, uh, are the 20 canonical amino acids that, that humans use, uh, that biology uses. Uh, uh, and so you get, you get not just the amino acids that we want, you get a lot of amino acids that you don't want. And how those ever got segregated, we don't know. But most of them never survive. And then once they land, an amino acid just sitting out. I mean, these things, if they were, if they were uh, uh, had high enantiomeric excesses ever, they start racemizing over time. And then you have all of UV influencing them. So, so, and once they get into an oxygen and oxygenated atmosphere and environment and UV, that would be another problem. But yes, they absolutely come in in very small amounts. And as John Sutherland said, uh, generally these compounds that come in on meteorites are unusable. And they're unusable because they're in vast mixtures. So what biology is able to do is you can take a whole handful of different supplements in the morning and, and just ingest these, and your body knows what to do with each one of these because you have enzymes. This is what biology does. Biology is amazing. Chemistry cannot do that. You have to do chemistry on pure compounds. You can't do chemistry on vast mixtures where you have 1% or less than 1% of what you want in there and have all these other things not compete with it. Because a carboxylic acid on one compound is gonna be just like a carboxylic acid on another compound and the, the two are gonna have similar reactivities. Same thing with an alcohol group, with an amine group. Uh, uh, so, so all of these things compete. So generally what comes in in meteorites is totally unusable. We can identify because we have these amazing tools, but they're unusable. Scientific research is typically published in peer review papers. Why not publish your claims in that format? Because everything that I've said has already been published. It's already been published. I'm not the first one to point this thing out. Karn Smith pointed this out. He had a whole book of this in the 1980s pointing this out. Leslie Orgel pointed this thing out. It's already in books. It's already in the literature. Everything that I am saying, there's nothing unique about it. But you guys don't read the literature. Most people don't read the literature. Only scientists read the literature. But what I'm doing is I'm bringing it to the masses in a YouTube format uh, uh, so everybody gets it. That's my motivation behind this. I've published hundreds and hundreds of papers. I know how to do that. It's no problem for me. In fact, it's much easier for me than making YouTube videos. YouTube videos for me is much harder. I have to make up the right slides. I have to get the cameras right. I got to get this thing set up. And sometimes I've recorded for hours and then noticed that I didn't have the sound turned on. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, so I'm not very good at this. Uh, whereas I can write a paper and get these things published. That's not what I'm trying to do. Other people are publishing this. So go ahead and read it if that's what you want to do. You want to read it in the peer-reviewed publications? Do it. It's out there. 
Other people have talked about this, and not just recently. For years, people have talked about this. So this is not just a recent thing that people have talked about. Are you qualified to discuss origin of life, given that you don't directly work in the field of systems chemistry? First of all, as far as systems chemistry, based on the nanotechnology that we do, that's very, very analogous to systems chemistry, where you have one piece working with another. What I'm pointing out is obvious to all synthetic chemists, and is synthetic chemists that are working in these areas of origin of life, because it's prebiology. It's prebiology. So everything I'm pointing out, it's certainly relevant. So when people say that this is just a straw man, this is nonsense. How can it be a straw man? I'm asking, how would you couple the two amino acids together? You want to make proteins? How do you get the two amino acids to couple together when delta G is positive? You want to heat that thing up? Well, what happens when you go through heating cycles and cooling cycles? Do the things racemize? You bet they do. How big polypeptides have you made through heating and cooling cycles? Oh, a 14 mer? That's not very big. And what happens is, how much racemization did you measure? Oh, you didn't measure it. Somebody's got to point this thing out. So yeah, I'm very well qualified for this. So that's not their, their critique. You won't see origin of life people working in the era of origin of life saying Jim Tour doesn't know what he's talking about because he himself doesn't work in the era of origin of life. They'll say the questions that I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking are quite relevant. Sarah Walker says that I'm putting up straw men. How can it be a straw man? How could it be a straw man? She's, she's, she's an a astrophysicist. She doesn't understand chemistry. I understand the chemistry. She's working in this area of, of origin of life. I am not, but I'm critiquing, she doesn't even understand it. How can asking how you're going to put two amino acids together? How are you going to put two saccharides together? That's the chemistry that has to be done for origin of life. How is that a straw man? This is the precise chemistry. I'm asking very simple questions. Where did the informational code come from? That's not a straw man. That's not a straw man at all. How would you put nucleotides together? How would you do that coupling to couple them together? This is a very precise question. This is not some general question that I'm shooting down. And I'm just asking the question, just go ahead and answer it. Why didn't they answer any of these things? Uh, because they can't. Because these are all unanswerable. Are you criticizing origin of life research to support a theological perspective? No, not at all. That's why you never see me bringing God into this. I don't need to bring God into this because the chemistry itself screams out that Life could not have formed that way. In fact, when I look at origin of life studies, and there's the suggestion that maybe this is how life came about, to me, this is screaming out, this is how it didn't happen. You had so much user input, none of that would have been available on an early earth. You used pure compounds, none of that would have been an available on an early earth. So I don't see this at all as, as, as being a, a theological thing. So I never bring God into it. Other people, like to say, oh, well, he's a creationist, therefore we don't have to engage him. No, this is a cop-out. I never brought God into this. Other people come with an anti-theological perspective and try to silence me. There's no theological perspective in this. I don't need it. I don't need the Bible to tell me that the chemistry would not work on an early earth. I don't need the Bible to tell me that the free energy is positive. These things would not go. You can't do condensation polymerization reactions in water. You can't do condensation polymerization reactions when you have mixtures of compounds there. That doesn't work. Bible doesn't tell me anything about that. It's all chemistry that tells me that. The formation of the sun and the planets took billions of years and cannot be recreated in a lab. Couldn't the same principle apply to abiogenesis? Maybe. So far, we haven't been able to reproduce abiogenesis, but don't you see? Everybody is putting these, these ideas forward. Everybody is putting these ideas forward on how it could have come about. And so they can go into the lab and test it. Conveniently, we're not making a planet. We're just trying to make a few compounds, a few molecular compounds. So go in the lab and try it. You're going to make a suggestion that's how life formed. Okay, that's fine. Go in your lab and see if you can do it. How much could you have made, how well could you have made those things when you're working on a prebiotically relevant type chemistry. You have to see, is the chemistry prebiotically relevant? That's what we want to be able to see. Is that chemistry prebiotically relevant? Meaning that you're not using any of the materials that would have been available, uh, that, that would not have been available on an early earth. You have to use just basic small compounds that might have been available. And uh, uh, you're not using this exacting chemistry that you can do in a lab. 
So uh, uh, this is something that we could do. So we have a lot more access to this than we do on a star creation, for example. So, so let's have at it. Haven't the Miller-Urey experiments demonstrated the production of amino acids one of life's building blocks? Absolutely. I mean, Miller-Urey identified, I don't know, four or five of them. But other people have gone back and done the same experiment and identified, I don't know, maybe 15 of the 20 canonical amino acids. The problem was all of those amino acids, of the 20 canonical amino acids, meaning the amino acids that, that, that uh, uh, all cells use, 19 of them are chiral. So you have to have a handedness. Miller-Urey made them without the handedness there. But that's not even just the biggest problem. They didn't just make those amino acids. They made another 100 amino acids that have nothing to do with life. That's a big problem. And you don't just make alpha amino acids. You, make, you, you might make other amino acids that are there. But even just with the alpha amino acids, there are a lot of them that life never used. So how do you segregate them? They come as mixtures. It's very hard to do chemistry once you have these mixtures. So yeah, Miller-Urey, and that was a great experiment. But that's not the end-all, be-all at all. I've already granted everybody. I'll, say, I'll give you all these small molecules. Go ahead and take it from there. Nobody can do anything. I mean, because the polymerization becomes a nightmare. You can't get the separations, and even if you could, you can't get the polymerizations. And you want to use wet-dry cycles where you go to these high heat conditions that are 125, 150 degrees uh, centigrade. Well, tell me about racemization. Have you ever studied racemization? These things are going to racemize, meaning that if you did have chirality, if you did have uh, high enantiomeric excess at that center, it's now racemized. It's changed. You've lost the handedness. So it's a big problem. Isn't it true that John Sutherland has synthesized RNA building blocks, nucleotides under prebiotic conditions? Yes, I've covered that in my 14-part series, which is uh, which you can check out online. I've written about that, so I've published uh, five artic articles on origin of life, and uh, I've written about that, and I showed the precision of his chemistry. Those aren't prebiotically relevant reactions. No way. I mean, you look through the chemistry that he's doing where you adjust pH up and down, he just temperatures, and then he can't take the material and carry it on. He has to scale it up using modern methods. So the whole relay problem kills him. And he hasn't made it in a chirally pure form, in an antimerically pure form. He hasn't made it that, that either. So yeah, can chemists do it? Yeah, can they do it under prebiotically relevant conditions? Absolutely not. Before you go, just remember, you can ask questions. I'll try to answer the questions. And, and uh, there's the email address that you can write to with your questions. And my, my producer will compile these. Uh, a lot of times the same question comes, and so you might, you might pick one of those questions. Uh, uh, so it might not be the exact words that you used, but it'll be like what you want. And uh, um, just send in questions, and, and we'd be glad to try to answer them. Thanks so 